The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalo Valyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to another session of your distant learning lesson. With me, your citizenship education teacher. I am called Madame Seka Kinyo Luisa. And today, we will be looking at Form 1 Citizenship Education. To begin with our, with our lesson, we will start by going through or by correcting the assignment we had in our last lesson, which is going to be done in question form. The question you took home last time was, what are the effects of inheritance disputes among family members? What are the effects of inheritance disputes among family members? As an example of action or the possible responses to this particular question where we can talk about disunity. When we talk about inheritance disputes, we are looking at a situation whereby at the death or the demise of a father or a parent, the children find themselves fighting over the property and this often leads to several problems. So we are looking at the consequences of this inheritance dispute and one amongst is disunity. It often leads to separation in the family. People quarrel, they disagree, and at the end of the day, they end up being disunited. The second aspect is that it may lead to disrespect amongst family members. When we start quarreling, misunderstanding each other, you will see the junior ones talking badly or talking with a lot of disrespect to the seniors, and eventually, there will be no respect amongst family members. Then we equally have another option, which is everlasting hatred. Some people find it so difficult to forgive. And in such circumstances like the family inheritance dispute we are looking at, you will realize that most often when people are unable to understand each other, eventually it may lead to hatred. And this hatred may become everlasting in such a way that it will become very difficult for them to resolve their disputes. So that is as far as the assignment we had last time. To proceed with our lesson, we are going to begin with the lesson plan. And the first aspect we are going to look at is previous knowledge. We are going to look at what we did in the last lesson. Then we'll move on to a situation in real life. The third aspect will be the learning activities, which will consist of the lesson of the day, then we'll look at the summary of the lesson. Definitely, we are going to have an exercise to test our understanding and we'll end with an assignment. So that is the lesson plan for today. Lesson eight, which is our lesson for today, is entitled The Road. But before we get to the road, we are going to begin with previous knowledge. And the previous knowledge or what we had in our last lesson, or the title of our last lesson was Family Inheritance Dispute and Its Effects. So to begin with, what do we mean by Family Inheritance Disputes? This consists of problems that arise amongst family members when it concerns the distribution or the sharing of property among family members. Most often, some people do not feel comfortable with what they have been given and as a result, they end up bringing problems and it ends up in a dispute. This family inheritance has to do with patrimony as well. What you can acquire 
what you can take over from your parents as an offspring. And the things that can be inherited differ from landed properties to companies to so many other things that can be inherited, including titles. Because we know that in the African continent and Cameroon to be precise, there are so many titles that our parents have been given, which most often at their demise, we are allowed to inherit. So we inherit all sorts of property, including lands, farms, houses, companies, and so many other things. And most often, like we said earlier, at the death of one of our parents, or at the death of our parents, we find it very difficult to be able to share this property equally if they were unable to write a will. We went ahead to look at the fact that it is very, very important for parents to write down their will because it enables the children to be able to know what was apportioned to each one of them. And when this is done, it reduces the level of disputes in the family. We have equally looked at the effects of this family inheritance disputes, that when property is not equally shared, it leads to so many problems in the family. And it is also very difficult for this property to be equally shared because most parents sometimes discriminate or they may do things that will favor some children against others and at the end of the day, it leads to disputes when they are no longer there to resolve the disputes. So we're saying that to resolve this issue, the most important way to resolve this issue of family inheritance disputes is for parents to write their will. And writing a will does not mean that you are prepared, that you are going to die the next day. It is just like preparing your family such that if you're not there, there will be no problems. They will be able to share the property among themselves without having any disputes. So that is what we talked about in our last lesson which consisted of family inheritance disputes. We are going to move ahead to look at a situation in real life with regards to the lesson we have today, which is entitled The Road. So we are going to have a situation that we have on the board, which says that, imagine that Inanga, on his way to school this morning, witnessed an accident. And he realized that a student was hit by a motorbike. And this motorbike was on high speed. This student obviously is unable to continue or to get to school on time because he has been hit by this motorbike. As a student who has acquired knowledge on this particular topic, what can you advise Enanga to do? Because from every indication, he obviously does not know how to use the road. So what would you tell him to do such that in future he will not be a victim of such an accident? As examples of actions, you are going to be telling him the various things to consider when using the road or when moving on the road. Because on the road we have different actors, which we are still going to look at as we dive properly into the lesson. So as examples of action, the first thing you can ask him to do is to always ensure that he respects traffic lights. What are traffic lights? They are special lights of different colors mounted on major road junctions to control the behavior of road users. We have colors on the traffic lights at the green color, which permits vehicles to move. We have the red, which allows pedestrians or those who move on foot on the road to move across the carriageway. And of course, we have the yellow or the orange. These are the colors we have on the traffic light. So you would be telling Inanga that if he is on the road and it is a green color, he is not supposed to move. He is expected to wait for all the vehicles to pass. Then when the color turns to red, he can move across the carriageway. That is going to help him not to be hit by a car. The second aspect is the fact that he is supposed to walk on the pedestrian path. The pedestrian path is always by the side of the road. So you don't move on the road itself because it is meant for the vehicles. The section that is meant for pedestrians is always constructed by the sides of the road. So you move, of course, on the direction facing oncoming vehicles. Another aspect is the fact that before he crosses the road, he's supposed to look left and right. And of course, left again to be sure 
that no vehicle is moving or coming and that you will be able to move across the road before a vehicle actually gets to that particular spot. So you're supposed to estimate the distance of the vehicle. That is if he sees a vehicle far off before he can continue moving across the road. Another aspect too is that he is supposed to know the path of the road properly. This one is very important because it is what we are going to be looking at. He must know the various parts of the road and of course the road users. Because each part of the road is apportioned to a particular road user. And when you are not using the section which is allowed or which you are supposed to use, you end up involving yourself in an accident. So it is very necessary for him to take into consideration all these aspects we have mentioned in order to stay off accidents. And apart from him alone, it is also a lesson to all other road users to be, to be very careful while using the road, such that they will be able to stay away from accidents. We are going to move on to the justification. And as far as the justification is concerned, we are looking at the importance of using the road properly. And just like you already know, there is no way you can go anywhere without using the road. So as justification to this lesson, it will enable road users to be able to know the various sections of the road, to know, not only knowing them, but know how to use them in order to avoid accidents. Because when we know how to use the road very well, we are going to be able to stay away from accidents, we'll be able to take proper care of ourselves. Let's now move into the lesson. What is the road? As definition to the road, it is a wide path constructed to ease the movement of all road users. It is a wide path constructed either by the government or by local authorities like the council to ease the movement of road users. And with regard to this, we are going to look at the types of roads before we get to who are road users. We have different types of roads. We have first of all what we refer to an, as, as an earth road. It's a normal road which is not tarred, which has dot, just been dug, in which we can have mud during the rainy season or dust during the dry season. Then we also have what we refer to as footpaths. What are footpaths? Footpaths are equally roads that are very, very small, which have not been constructed, which permit the movement of few persons. Only two people may bypass on a footpath at a particular point in time. And these footpaths are mostly common in villages, or they are mostly common in the, in the that is the, most of the road paths are found in most villages, or they lead people to their farms. The third type of road we are going to look at is the tar roads. These are common roads that we find in most cities like Yaoundé, like Douala, Bafusam, and many other towns. They are roads that have been well constructed, they have been dug, and they are well tarred to enable the movement of the users. The next aspect we are going to look at is road users. We have been talking about road users right from the definition of the road. Who are these road users? They are simply people, groups of people, who use the road during different occasions and different parts, they equally use different parts of the road. So the first road users we are going to look at are the pedestrians. Majority of citizens in a given country are usually pedestrians. Even if you have a car, once in a while, you find yourself being a pedestrian. So who is a pedestrian? Pedestrians are people who move on foot on the road. People who move on foot on the road, they neither use bikes nor cars. So if you're using your legs to move on the road, it means that you are a pedestrian. The second that we are going to look at are motorists. Motorists are people who drive different types of cars, from lorries to private cars, taxis and sports cars, whatever type of car that you're driving, you are known as a motorist. The next, we have motorbike riders. We know that sometimes before we get to school or to work or to wherever in the morning, in order to beat traffic, we take motorbikes. So those who ride the motorbikes that we decide to take in the morning when we are rushing to beat traffic, they are known as motorbike riders. And most of these motorbike riders do it for commercial purposes. It means that it is their occupation. 
Even though we equally have people who ride their private bikes to their job site or to wherever they are going to. So whosoever we are referring to in this case, so long as the person is riding a bike, he is known as a bike rider. Then we equally have cyclists. Cyclists are simply people who ride on bicycles on the road as well. So between a cyclist and a motorbike rider, there is just a slight difference. Cyclists ride bicycles while motorbike riders ride uh, motorbikes. All right, before us, we have a document or a diagram which represents a road. And this diagram would enable us to understand the various parts of the road. So when you look at it very well, you realize that from this point to this one is the area we refer to as the road. So all of this is what we refer to as the road. And when you look at it properly, you realize that this road is divided into two parts. We have this section, then we have another section here, which means that one of these sections permit vehicles to move across in one line of traffic without any form of obstruction. So this space, which permits vehicles to move either down this way or up the other way, is known as a lane. So this section of the road, which permits vehicles to move in one line of traffic, it is known as the lane. Then, when you look at the road again, you realize that there is something that divides this road into two. There is a specific line which divides the road into two. In most roads, you realize that you can have a thick white line drawn in the middle of the road, or there is an elevated section that is constructed to divide the road into two to ensure that vehicles move in both sections without causing an accident. So each of these is known as a lane. It therefore means that this road has two lanes. In other roads, you may even have four or eight, depending on how many vehicles are able to move on a road at the same time. So this line, that imaginary line sometimes, that divides the road into two is known as the pavement. So this line is called the pavement. All right, let's move on. You would also realize that somewhere along the road, you will see thick white lines. Thick white lines drawn on the road itself. That is called the zebra crossing or the panda crossing. Because it enables those who move on foot, the pedestrians like we said earlier on, to be able to move across the road without being hit by a car. Because at this point, it is their right to move here without anybody being disturbed. So, we have talked about the zebra crossing, we have looked at the lane as well as the pavement. We have equally talked about the pedestrian. If we move on foot on the road, it means that there is a specific section that is supposed to be left for those who are moving on foot. That is why we have this section of the road, which we said is by the side of the road itself, which permits pedestrians to move. So this is what we refer to as this, the, the, the pedestrian path. The, the sides of the road, like here and here, which permit the pedestrians to move. And apart from that, we equally have the last end of the road, which is referred to as a gutter, which permits runoffs or rainwater to flow without necessarily destroying the road. Because when there is no gutter on the road, it may end up destroying the road. So on this diagram, you can be able to identify the various parts of the road from the lane, which permits vehicles to move in one line of traffic, to the pavement, which divides the road into two. And like I said, with the pavement, it's not always uniform. Sometimes you may have a road without a line that actually proves that there's a pavement. But the drivers already understand themselves and they know their rights. On some roads, you have a thick white line dividing the road into two, representing the pavement. And on others, you will not have a thick white line and you would have Rather, you would have an elevated portion constructed. This one is mostly common when you are approaching the junctions or the roundabouts. So you will have that portion constructed to demarcate or to show the two lanes on which vehicles are expected to move. Then we have the pedestrian path, the zebra crossing, and those are the parts of the road we can talk about. So we have made mention of the lane. So the lane permits vehicles to move in one line of traffic. Because on any road, you realize that 
sometimes there are always two vehicles or four, depending on the size of the road. So when a vehicle allows, or when the road allows a vehicle to move in one line of traffic, it means that that section of the road alone is called a lane. Then the second one that we have looked at is the pavement. And we have said that it's a line that divides the road into two equal halves and permits vehicles to move without touching each other or without causing an accident. The third is the pedestrian path. It is a section of the road which allows pedestrians to move freely without being disturbed either by a bike rider or a motorist. And we have said motorists are those who drive in all sorts of cars. We equally have the zebra line. The zebra line is usually made up of thick white lines drawn on the road itself, which enables pedestrians to move across the carriageway without being hit by a car. And to enable us to use this zebra line, most often we have the traffic lights, which permits the road users to know when they are expected to use the road. The next is the roundabout. The roundabout is the, the turning point where vehicles meet and they turn to different directions. And when any driver or rather motorist or motorbike rider or cyclist or whosoever is approaching the junction, he is advised to slow down because at this particular junction, so many vehicles are coming from different directions and driving or riding at high speed would be at your own risk. So it is always advisable to slow down when approaching the junction. The next one that we have talked about is a gutter. It is simply a space dug by the side of the road, precisely at the edge of the pedestrian path, which allows runoffs or water to flow. Then, for us to be able to use the road properly, be it as pedestrians, as motorists, whosoever, you realize that we need road signs. So what are these road signs? They are simply paintings made in different colors and shapes, as well as sizes, which enables us to use the road properly. It controls the behavior of road users on the road. And there are so many of these signs. Some of them help us to be able to identify specific places, like hospitals, like churches, to be able to know what is ahead, like maybe a cliff, or a corner, or whatsoever, so that we'll be able to avoid accidents. So before us, we have a document in which we can be able to see certain drawings, which enable us to know that on the road, when you see all this, you will know what is ahead of you. We'll just identify a few. On the first one, you have turn left. It means that as a motorist, if you're driving and you realize that there is this road sign before you, you should be expecting to turn left as you drive ahead. We equally have another one here, maximum speed 30. This one means you are not supposed to drive above 30 as the maximum speed. Then we equally have this one, which is very common, no parking. Where you see a P, then there is a line that, red line that moves across the P. It means that you are not expected to park at that particular location. So these are some of the road signs that we have or that we find on the road as we move or as we drive in our cars. So as far as the road signs are concerned, we have talked about the speed brakes and speed brakes are normally elevated portions, sometimes constructed when you are approaching the junction or before a school because they know that students or children or pupils may be moving across the road. So those speed brakes are very necessary to limit the speed at which motorists and motorbikes are riding and driving. We also have the traffic lights, which we said consist of lights made up of different colors, which are mounted by the roadside to control or which are mounted by some road junctions to control the behavior of road users. So we equally have others like maximum speed, school children crossing, we have turn left, turn right, and so many other road signs. What are the importance of these road signs? You will realize that they are very important, without which they will not be drawn. Because as you move around the town, or even as you move out of town, you see them by the roadside, you see them drawn on the road itself, 
on, in different colors and shapes. And they are always very visible, which means that they are very, very important for all road users. As important for the road signs, you realize that it enables all citizens, it enables all road users to be able to avoid accidents. Take, for instance, something like speed brake. That's one of the road signs. If you are unable to read and understand this road sign, which indicates that there is a speed brake ahead of you, as a motorist, you just drive normally and you bump into it, and before you know it, you're involved in an accident. So these road signs enable us to avoid accidents. The second aspect is that it also enables us to know what is ahead of us. We talked about aspects like turning, left, turning right or turning left, or even a cliff that may be found ahead of you. So when driving or riding or even moving along the road, you are expected to look at the road signs and try to understand them. If you can't, you can ask someone who is by you so that you'll be able to prepare yourself ahead or uh, uh, to, be, to face what is ahead of you. Then we equally have this other one. Road signs help vehicles to slow down before approaching schools. We talked about uh, speed brakes. That we, speed brakes are normally constructed before you get to a school or before a school. This enables drivers and motorbike riders to be able to respect the speed limit and reduce or slow down because pupils may be crossing and moving on high speed would not be actually very good for them. <laughs> We cannot end this lesson without having an exercise to test and see if the lesson was understood. The first question we have is, which of the following is a part of the road which allows vehicles to move in one line of traffic? Vehicles to move in one line of traffic. We have A, pedestrian path, B, the lane, C, the pavement, and D, we have a roundabout. Of course, the answer to this question is B which is the lane. We said that for the road to be properly used, each road user must know the section he or she is supposed to use. So B is the right answer because the section which allows vehicles to move in one line of traffic is known as the lane. For the pavement, we have said it's a line which divides the road into two. For the roundabout, we have equally said it is a section of the road where vehicles meet and turn to different directions and that as a motorist or a motorbike rider, you are supposed to slow down when approaching the roundabout. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> so the next question is, an area of the road where many vehicles meet is called A, the roundabout, B, the zebra crossing, C, the pedestrian path, and D is the lane. The correct answer to this question is A, which is a roundabout, because we have said it is that section of the road where vehicles come from different directions, meet, and they turn and pick or take whatever direction which they intended to take. Zebra crossing is something else. It is that section of the road which is marked with thick white lines, which permit pedestrians to move across the road. Question three says, which road signs need to be mounted around a school? Which road signs need to be mounted around the school? We have A, hospital, B, bends, C, speed brakes, and D, railway crossings. The correct answer here is speed brakes. Why is it speed brakes? Because all motorists, motorbike riders, as well as cyclists, are supposed to slow down when approaching a school because children may have closed or they may be going out and they are unable to use the road properly so it is necessary for them to so slow down in order not to hit the children or to cause an accident. So the right answer there is C. Question four says, who is a cyclist? A, someone who drives on the road. B, someone who rides a motorbike, a motorcycle. C, someone who drives a truck. And D, someone who rides a bicycle. Of course, the answer to this question is D someone who drives a bicycle because someone who drives a car is called a motorist those who drive on or ride on motorbikes they are called motorbike riders 
While those who ride on bicycles, they are known as cyclists. So the correct answer to this question is D, which is those who ride on bicycles. Question 5 says, state the various ways in which road signs are important to road users. How are road signs important to road users? We are just going to identify a few road signs and we look at their importance. Take for instance, the road sign that represents H. When you see a capital H somewhere by the side of the road, it means that it is representing that there is a hospital somewhere around that particular area. It will enable you to know that if you had an injury and you're looking for a clinic or a hospital where you can get consulted, you would immediately find yourself in that hospital. Road signs are equally important because it helps or they help us to be able to avoid road accidents because we are able to know what is ahead of us. They are also very important because they help drivers to know what is ahead of them. For instance, they may have a cliff, they may have a corner which is sharp, or they may have a hill which is very steep. So these road signs are very important to all road users which we have looked at, ranging from motorists to motorbike riders, cyclists, and of course, the pedestrians. Okay. So these are the possible responses to the question we just looked at. And of course, you cannot go home without taking an assignment. So the assignment for our next lesson, or the assignment to do in order to prepare for our next lesson is, what are the causes and effects of road accidents? Causes and effects of road accidents. So that is what you are going to take home as assignment in preparation for the next lesson. So on the board, we have the references or the various books that were used. And our next lesson will be entitled The Highway Code. <laughs> Ngani la kiri watergendong Esotina bia dinkido Mane tambia ninya ne injo bia yen Tam tama mote tam zabike Tam tama tonge tam zabike Tam tam tama mote tam zabike Mane tambia ninya ne injo bia yen